Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to share with you. It's been quite a while since I've been up here on the stage when I think about it. And, uh, you know, when uh, we were planning earlier in the year about assemblies, and, you know, the staff gets to pick what topics they want to, might want to talk about, I chose religious liberty. Unfortunately, we decided not to put that in the lineup for some reason, so I thought I'd share tonight <laughs> a little bit about that. I call this Render Unto Caesar, and uh, let's open the prayer. First of all, Lord, we thank you, Father, again, for the opportunity to come apart and hear from your word, Lord, and hear what you would have us to know about a present situation, Lord. Uh, may your spirit be here to give me your words, and that they be found in receptive hearts, Lord, to, to uh, better inform us on uh, what you would have us to do. If I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Render unto Caesar is a, it takes from a, comes from a text in Mark 12, 17, where Jesus tells the disciples, or actually the leaders of his day, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. There's a separation there, isn't there, between those two entities, always should be. The thing we need to understand is um, which belongs to what. Sometimes we are a little foggy on that. Sometimes what belongs to Caesar, what belongs to God. And once you understand the delineation, it's not too hard to see that we've experienced a constitutional crisis in this past year uh, of the wall of separation being breached uh, in a way we don't normally think of it being breached. Where well, the state has come along and said, you can't do this in your churches. You can't meet, even though we're gonna leave abortion clinics and pot shops open, you have to shut down your church. I'm simply amazed as how few of our own people are realizing this, seeing this for what it is. And it's happening right in front of us. Our religious freedom has basically evaporated overnight in this past year. Many leaders will often cite Romans 13 as a reason we should just quietly submit and go along with this. Well, I fully believe in that text. I believe in the rule of law. I believe we should obey the laws of our land. I have no problem with that. But I think we need to understand how this text applies in our current day to day. For instance, I'd like to ask a question here. You can volunteer an answer if you like. Who or what is the highest authority in the United States, do you suppose? Hmm? The president? Any other guesses? Hmm? Congress? Any others? God? <laughs> well, in a theocracy would be the case. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Actually, this is a document right here, the Constitution. This is the highest law in the land. The president, his authorities are derived from this document. The Congress's authorities and, and what the judges do in the Supreme Court are outlined in this document. In fact, anything they say, anything they enact, anything they decree that violates the document is null and void, legally standing, legally speaking, you know. And so when you look at Romans 13, we need to understand that this is the, the highest law that you were referring to there in Romans 13. Um, I think it's important to understand too that there are two ways nations are governed in the world historically over the last five, 6,000 years. Uh, one concept is called the rule of man and that is called the rule of law. Rule of man is pretty much the way things have been done for the last 5,000 years until the establishment of the U.S., with the exception of the nation of Israel. Rule of law is where there's a king, there's an emperor, and there's a dictator of some kind, and his word is law. And there's nothing higher than that. Whatever he says goes. The problem with that is, with man's sinful nature, it doesn't turn out well. It normally ends up in tyranny. When you're under the sway of the whims of sinful man, life is unpredictable, unstable, you don't know what's gonna happen. And this is the primary reason socialism has, has and always will fail 
because it's based on this concept. It doesn't recognize the sinful nature of man. Under the second concept, there's a transcendent law, such as the Constitution, that's above everything else. It's the ultimate law, not some man or president or governor thinks. And this is the way Israel was established, only they had, instead of the Constitution, they had the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law to follow. That was the highest law in Israel. There was no federal government in Israel. The whole nation was governed through local municipalities and judges and various tribes, and they administered the law of God in various cases. If there was a case that was too hard for them, they would go to the tabernacle or the, or the temple and let God decide through the priesthood. That's why it was called theocracy. God was the ultimate ruler. When I talk about theocracy, I want to make something very clear here. Some people refer to the Catholic Church as a theocracy. Well, is God the king of the Catholic Church? No, he's not. The Pope is. So, when a true theocracy, God is a king, isn't he? And his law is supreme. Now, when Israel chose a human king, that all changed, didn't they? they? They exchanged the rule of law for the rule of man. And it wasn't good, was it? Major apostasy at that point. We see even the best of people, David, a man after God's own heart, committing terrible th atrocities because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, especially with sinful mortals. History shows that the rule of law is the best for religious liberty and liberty of conscience. In the history since that time, only one nation has come close to the rule of law, and that'll be the Medo-Persians. We see an example of this in Daniel 6, where he says, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So here we see an example of the law again being supreme. The only, it's kind of a blending, though. It's kind of a hybrid because who made that law? The king did. So it's kind of the, king, the rule of man and the rule of law kind of combined, you could say. So really, the United States is the first nation since Israel that was established upon the basis of the rule of law. That law being the Constitution was largely based on the biblical principles as the founders understood them, too. That's why it works so well, by the way. The reason this nation has been prosperous and had unprecedented freedom is because the leaders followed the biblical principles that they, as they saw at that time. It was not established by any one man. There's a group of representatives. Again, following the example of the Bible. In Acts 15, we have a representative form of government, don't we? We have representatives get together and drew up this Constitution. And any amendments, any other unjustly enacted laws of our nation are also put in place by a group of people, representatives. So it's not the same as what things used to be. Even any executive orders issued by a president or a governor have to be in harmony with this document or, or previously enacted at law. So when Romans 13 was written, what concept were we under at that time? Rule of man or rule of law? Rule of man. We had a, a Caesar, an emperor. His word was law. No one could do anything else. And Christians rendered unto Caesar, as Jesus said, except when the, the, the contra contradicted with what, the, what God wanted. So how does this apply under the rule of law then? When it says here governing authorities, again, what's the highest governing authority? It's the Constitution. And so in verse 2, whoever resists authority resists the ordinance of God. Okay, if this authority, if the Constitution is the highest authority, then the Constitution also has the ordinance of God, isn't it? It's God's will we follow that document. And those who resist, God's not happy with, are they? I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. So anyone who rebels against authority, that in this case being the Constitution, is rebelling against what God has instituted and they'll be punished. So did God really institute the U.S. Constitution? In a way, uh, look at what Daniel says in chapter two. He changes times and seasons, he removes kings and raises up kings. So God is intimately involved in the affairs of nations and who's in charge, including this document we're talking about here, you know. Even when we have an election, we, we think we're choosing? <laughs> God's involved somehow, I'm sure he is. He's overseeing everything. Also in prophecy, I like this text here, Romans 12:16. This is a text, by the way, about America. I don't know if you know that. The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon it spewed out of its mouth. So what does this mean? Let's look, let's look at the symbols and put it all together here. 
That dragon is the state church of persecuting Christians at this point, isn't it? It's during the Dark Ages, during the, during the 1260 years. And the flood, what's, our, what, what's water represent? Pro Bible prophecy. Lots of people, right? And even in, in Psalms and other places, the, uh, the floods are referred to, armies are referred to, to as floods. And North America, the earth is North America, often referred to as the earth in other places too, like Re uh, Revelation 13, 11. So what is this telling us? That God provided this land as a church for his place to grow and be established. A place to send missionaries to all lands. This is all God's doing. And do you know what makes this possible, by the way? That type of economic system we have called free market capitalism. Without, with, because of that, individuals can have enough prosperity to give disposable income to give to missions. That didn't happen before America. People, the average person didn't have money to send to give to missions. Now they do because they have the freedom to prosper and do well. Whose idea is freedom to be supposed, by the way? Where does freedom come from? The Spirit of God. When the founders said, our freedoms come from God, not from government, they probably had this text in mind, other texts like that. Our freedoms do come from God. And it's God's will that the government not, not interfere in those freedoms. And finally, one final prophecy, Revelation 13, 11, I alluded to a little, a little while ago. Saw another beast coming up out of the earth, had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Who is the lamb, of, by the way, in Revelation? Jesus. Two horns like Jesus. Jesus don't have horns, but this is symbolic. <laughs> there are 29 mentions of the lamb in the book of Revelation. Every one of them is about Jesus. Every last one of them. So even though some will want to speak with me about this, why would it be different right here? Two horns like a lamb. What does that mean, then? I mean, this nation has been established upon the lambs ideals for governance, the rule of law, and the thing we talked about here. Or, or, this is the kind of authority that we're not to resist, according to Revelation, Romans 13. Any violation of this is speaking like a dragon. Do you know that the dragon is used as a symbol of totalitarian power? If you look at uh, every place where the dragon is brought up in Revelation, it's talking about a totalitarian power, like Imperial Rome, Papal Rome, or even the French Revolution, for instance, I think is uh, Leviathan, which is the seven-headed dragon, you know. So, um, when you talking about speaking like a dragon, we're talking about speaking um, like a totalitarian power. So who are these two horns, by the way? What do these two horns represent? In Great Controversy, Ellen White says republicanism and Protestantism became the fundamental principles of the nation. What's Protestantism? It's Christianity, right? So Christianity is one of the fundamental principles that the nation is built, built upon, isn't it? This makes the U.S. a Christian nation. Now some people have a problem with me saying that, one of which is the editor of Liberty Magazine for some reason. But uh, to me it's inescapable when you put all these things together. Because those people don't like this idea of calling us a Christian nation, I'd like to ask a simple question. What other belief system in the world holds highly or values religious liberty? Here's a list. Pick from. How about Islam? Do they believe in religious liberty? What about Buddhism or Hinduism? You know, when, when the gospel started opening up in India, the Hindus resorted to violence, tried to put it down. How about secular humanism? I see too many people today, sometimes even Liberty Magazine, saying we need a secular government to ensure our freedoms. How well does that work in North, North Korea right now, or Cuba, or China? My friends, religious liberty is uniquely a Christian concept. It's a Christian value. There's no other belief system that holds that to be, to be valid. So for us to have freedoms, our nation has to be a Christian nation. Now, some people think, well, that means making people become Christians. No, no, no. You don't understand what Christianity is about. Then do you? <laughs> Being a Christian is not about forcing people to be Christians, is it? It's about giving, giving people the, short, the, the right and choice to choose what they want to do. That's why you know, our religious liberty department actually stood up for the Native Americans when there was a court case against them smoking peyote in their, their, their religious ceremonies. 
you don't have to agree with the, the concept to, be, to, to agree with the fact they have the right to do this because religious freedom demands that they choose what they want to do for their religious observances. And why is this? Because of what the Bible says. Speaking like a dragon, again, is totalitarian power. And we're seeing this, this playing out in our country today. Uh, here's what the First Amendment actually says. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or they're prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's what they're doing when they're shutting down churches. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Many people refer to this as our first freedoms because they're so foundational to everything else in, 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 in our Constitution. And these things I've highlighted here are what's being trampled upon this year, right and left. I've had some people want to talk, about, talk to them about this, say, well, I don't see any biblical pr principle being violated here. Well, what about this text? Not forsaken assembling ourselves together. We're told not to do that, right? You all know about this text. Here's another one you might not be aware of, though. It's in the law of God. Do you know that? Leviticus 23.3. Six days shall, the, shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest. And what are we to do on that day? Have a holy convocation. What is that? It's assembly. It's, it's, it's a church service. The, the original Hebrew word here... Um, Mikra means a sacred assembly for the purpose of reading, reading the Bible, of course, you see. So we're told in the law of God to do that, aren't we? Do you think that's standing up for it, worth standing up for? It's regarding the Sabbath, right? I think it is. And yet we have governors and others, some to, to this day, California, I call it the People's Republic of California, <laughs> is not allowing churches to meet after all this time. They're speaking like a dragon. What are we to do in time like this? Well, historically, what have others done? What did Peter and the apostles do when they said, you can't preach in the temple, you can't talk about Jesus? What did they do? They well, talked about Jesus anyway, didn't they? We have, to, we have to accept some risk here and some consequences sometimes if we're going to have, have freedom. Freedom is never free, as they say. What did Martin Luther do when he was told by the Diet of Worms, you are a heretic and you should be burned at the stake? He had to go in hiding for all Fort Burke Castle, but he, he translated the Bible into German while he was there. He kept on doing the work of God. Where are the leaders of today like that, my friends? Well, here's one, John MacArthur out in California. He decided to open up his church. Enough is enough. I'm going to stand up for my rights. Will there be consequences? Probably. Are we willing to risk those consequences? There's always going to be consequences because the Marxists don't give up easy. They don't give up their power easy. But my friend, the good news is, unlike Martin Luther and the apostles, we have additional resources on our side. We have the highest law in the land, don't we? This is our defense. And we need to stand up for this because this, this document is the only thing that stands between us and the mark of the beast. You know that. If we let this slide, we're opening the door for other things we don't want to look at, we don't want to consider. In fact, today, there's an organization like Alliance Defending Freedom. And this is just one. This is kind of one of the first ones that came out. There's a bunch of these out there, First Freedom Institute, et cetera, that will actually represent churches whose First Amendment rights are being violated free of charge. People donate to this organization so they have the funds to do that. This particular organization, the one that took, took the Jack Phillips case, remember Jack Phillips who wouldn't bake a wedding cake for a gay couple out in Denver, Colorado? They took that to always seem Supreme Court and won. You think they'd do the same for us? Why not? I don't see why they wouldn't. We need to do this if, it's, if we want to value our God-given freedoms. And the, preacher, the wise preacher of Ecclesiastes tells us why. Because the sentence against the evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, if they get away with it, they're just going to keep on doing it. Stuart, John Stuart Mill, a British philosopher, stated the same truth in his own words when he said, Bad men need nothing more 
to compass their ends, then good men should look on and do nothing. Are we going to look on and do nothing? How few today are taking the courage like Dietrich Bonhoeffer did? How few pastors are out there paying the price for our religious liberty? I wish I could say there's some Adventist pastors out there doing this. Maybe there are. I didn't start in the news yet. I was, when I was talking to the Missouri Conference this week, or last week, they told me there's lots of their churches stayed open in Iowa. Their state is not as draconian as most of the other states in the country right now. Some people will say, though, people in the press and other secular sources, you're just being selfish. You don't care about people dying. You, don't want, you just want to care about your churches operating. You know, some of my friends, I do care about people dying. I care people, about people, people dying eternally in the lake of fire. That's what I care about. People out there need to be set free, don't they? People are in bondage to the lies of the world. They're in bondage to their sins. We have the answer, don't we? We have the gospel that can set the captives free. But if our churches are shut down, how can we do this? How effectively can we do this? Oh, we have electronic media, of course, and we've been doing meetings over line. And I commend, I'm glad we're doing that, to, quite honestly. But how effective is it compared to the normal way? Anybody who knows anything about evangelism, and, 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 and Brother Moore, if he's still here, one of the he could he test to this, he's been, he's been involved in per, per, uh, public evangelism. You cement the decisions in the home, talking to people in person. Oh yeah, they'll fill out the card in the meeting, everything, but you always, I mean, any evangelist will tell you this, you always go to the home and, and, and cement that decision. If, if we're shut down, how can we do that? One of the very first steps in any evangelism, personal, public, is establishing a friendship with the person you're trying to reach, establishing trust, building a relationship with them. How can you do that under our current conditions? It's hampering us. Yeah, we're having, we're having some results, but it's not what it could be. And people are being lost because of it. People who could be saved, people who could be set free are still in bondage. We all know that someday we're going to face another constitutional crisis, aren't we? It's another mark of the beast. We'll be called by God then, as now, to resist with civil disobedience. But if we aren't resisting now, what makes, me think, what makes us think we will then? In fact, by not resisting, resisting now, we're setting a da dangerous precedent. You know that. When the mark of the beast comes along, the authorities can legitimately say, well, you didn't have a problem with shutting down the churches. Why, this, why is this this big deal? They might even ask, don't you care about people? Because probably there's going to be some big catastrophe happen that's going to spark this mark of the beast uh, cascade of events. It's now that we need to take a stand, my friends. God's got us in training. If Jeremiah were alive today, he might ask us this question. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how can you contend with horses? In other words, if you can't handle the little stuff, how are you going to handle the big stuff? Since Jeremiah is not here to ask it, I'm going to ask it. If you can't run with the footmen, how can you contend with the horses, my friends? God's given us a chance now to build our spiritual resolve, to build our spiritual muscle, you might say, by using them. I know what this is like. I, I was in auto repair for 30 years. And you know, almost every auto shop out there is open on Sabbath morning, almost without fail. I had to take my stand quite often. I know what it's like to think you're going to lose your job. And I actually did lose my job, the last job I had, over the Sabbath. How many of us are willing to take that risk? Too many of us have never faced that challenge. And that's I, I, <laughs> that's a good, a good thing in a way. You had it easy. But in the same way, these challenges make us stronger for the final conflict, don't they? It's like Olympic training. We're, we're, get, we're in training for the, the big event. And if we don't take advantage of that, we may fail at the big event. In light of all this, we need to make some decisions here. We need to covenant with God not to be so weak and ask God to give us strength and resolve to stand 
or need to. Not allow our, our liberty to be trampled upon like they have been. Especially our leaders, wherever they may be, from the local church leadership on up. We're looking upon you to give us a godly example of how to stand in the last days. Because the test is upon us right now, isn't it? It truly is. There are thousands of people right here in America who need the saving message of Jesus, aren't don't they? Our cameras are out there right now, reaching some of them. We all need to be involved in that. We can't let the rule of man take that right away. People will die. They will die eternally. I don't want that, do you? I'm called to that. I'm, I'm called to that. So let's take Romans 13 to heart. Apply it as it should be to our present day. And live out that injunction in the, in the light of the rule of law that God has put in place here in America. Let's take our stand for our God-given liberty. Are we going to do that, my friends? Let's today take some time to pray for our leaders, pray for ourselves, have the strength to do that. Thanks for joining us for prayer meeting. Feel free to continue praying wherever you may be. We believe that prayer changes things. If you have been blessed by this program, why not leave a special prayer request or praise report in the comments below? And we'll share it with our prayer team. May God be with you.